Good morning, everyone. As we wait for the lights to come on, let me welcome you to Brookings. I'm Mike O'Hanlon, and we're delighted here at Brookings to be partnering with Blue Star families in this important discussion based on their survey and ranging across a wide uh, number of issues for military families and veterans about the stresses and strains and challenges of military service in today's world. Uh, it's an honor, as I say, for us to be involved in this. The way we're going to proceed, having seen this excellent video, is I just want to uh, give this brief word of welcome and introduce very briefly my good friend Kathy Roth Duque, uh, who's the CEO of Blue Star Families. And then she will offer some thoughts and some comments, and then we'll convene a panel, including with the uh, Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel Matters, as well as some other experts from Blue Star Families and from Syracuse on uh, these same sets of subjects. A brief word about Kathy. I've known her for more than 20 years. She and I were graduate students together at Princeton. She's a military spouse. Uh, she wrote, partly as a result of her experience as a military spouse, one of the most important books uh, of modern civil military relations in the United States. And since it's November and Christmas is coming, for, the, for, for those of you who haven't yet uh, read this, AWOL, The Unexcused Absence of America's Upper Classes, from Military Service and How It Hurts Our Country, a book she wrote with Frank Schaefer, uh, remains a very, very powerful voice and important activist on this set of issues. And uh, so let me uh, please ask all of you to join in welcoming Blue Star families, and specifically Kathy, to Brookings. Mike O'Hanlon, proving that he is indeed a very good friend. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for joining me here today. And I, I want to thank our sponsors and our friends and partners who made this possible. USAA, Mike Kelly is here with us today. Um, Lockheed Martin, Marianne Downs. Um, Facebook, who's not with us today. Uh, Northrop Grumman, I'm not sure if Karen is with us. Um, and, and many others. A and in addition, you saw on that last screen, um, our partners, those are the people who help us put this survey out. They help us. Uh, suggest topics and questions we might want to ask and push out um, to their constituencies and their members, uh, the people they touch, so that we can have the widest possible girth. If people are here from our partner organizations now, would you raise your hand so we can recognize you? Raise them higher. Thank you. We are a village. We need each other uh, in the government, in uh, the nonprofit space, in the foundations and corporations, um, in the think tanks. So what we are doing here, I hope we can model for the country. I, I love our survey. It was the very first thing Blue Star Families did when we decided to become an organization. A group of military family members, myself and others, wanted to keep doing the job of defending and supporting our country through being part of a military family as, with, as a service member or as a spouse, um, as a family. But it was hard. And we have the responsibility not only to the job of our country, but to the job of taking care of our family. And we felt that that job could be easier. But it wasn't something any one of us as an individual person could make easier by ourselves. It was something we needed to work together as a community so that we could articulate to the larger society what the challenges are and what we thought perhaps the solutions might be and work together with the different sectors, the government, nonprofits, communities, um, others to get to a better place so we could keep doing this mission that we, we did love but we couldn't do at the expense of our families just like any other American can't do something that hurts their families. Um, and so that's the premise of Blue Star Families, is for us to provide a platform for military families to articulate their solutions, to help solve them, to provide a fellowship that makes the job possible. We knew we needed data. Anecdote, everyone has an anecdote, but we wanted, we wanted to know that we had, were on the right track. And so we fielded a survey. And that not only helped us tell the story, um, but helped us understand where we wanted to focus our efforts. And it gave us, gives us surprising outcomes every year. This is the eighth time we've told the story. This is the eighth time we've um, uh, 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 distributed the survey. Um, and uh, we get to ask different things each year because we allow people to give open-ended responses. And by giving open-ended responses, we're not only forcing people to give the answers they want, which is something that had often frustrated me in surveys I'd taken in the past. 
do you feel that deployment has helped your children or hurt your children? Well, both, the answer is both, but both wasn't a choice. So we let people tell us things that maybe we don't know to ask. And based on that, we ask new questions in subsequent years. And I think a great example of that is our experience with our families and our experience with communities. Um, I, I'm also very proud this year that we um, got a lot more data on the experience of women serving in uniform because I think that can be very helpful for us to creating the kind of force we want to have in the future. For me, the survey is full of good news because it's full of pathways forward. It's full of ways that we can really create a 21st century military force for a 21st century family unit that lives in a 21st century society. Um, the community issues are key. We do not live on bases anymore. We live in communities, but we're such a small number and our lifestyle is so different from others and we are moving so frequently, often we don't know our neighbors. When we asked the question, how many conversations did you have with people outside of the military in your community in the past month, 30% of service members said zero. So that gives us an opportunity. That's something we know we want to change because we also saw that when people were engaged in their communities, when they did feel they belonged, when they did have conversations, they actually felt better about their military service and they felt more likely to recommend it to others. So there you go, it's a path forward. I was very, very interested to see that the number one issues for service members, not just for spouses, but for service members, their number one concern in their ability to continue doing their job was the time away from family. In the years that we've done this survey since 2009, and in fact in any survey I've ever seen, whether it was done by the Triangle Institute for Security Studies or any of the other major studies, that has never been the number one concern for service members about their service. I also suspect it's never been offered as an option for people to answer because it's not what we think about when we think about a person in uniform and what makes their job hard. But that's a really important insight. Why? Well, one of the things I mentioned last night is the unintended consequences of some of the policies and, and outcomes that we have in place drive families apart more than they used to. Uh, Michael Hanlon did a great job with a book that came out last year talking about some of those issues, moving back our forward deployed bases. It used to be when the Army deployed overseas, their families went with them. Increasingly, they're going without their families because we've closed those bases. That might have been a good decision, the under what or not, but the unintended consequences is more separation. Sequestration means very short notice on moves, on trainings, on deployments often. That causes greater separation. Sometimes the families can't move as much the needs of a 21st century lifestyle and the need to field two incomes. Increasingly, families are just choosing to live apart to keep that second income going so they can stay afloat as a family. 25% of our families say that they choose to live apart. That's a concern for anyone who wants to have their families thrive. So we have outcomes that no one wanted, but they are putting pressure on top of the fact that our force is millennials and millennials have a high, higher uh, concern and expectation about their family lives and our forces more are more female and uh, for them the cost of being away from their families what they report back to us is is in rates even higher so we encourage you to dive into the survey there are so many nuggets like this to help us understand the challenges and to understand the opportunities forward the overall message is that is, is really very similar to what it's always been. We need to tell this story. Uh, Blue Star Family's mission is to tell the story and to create community and solutions through communities uh, around the country. So it's a call to action for us, but I think it's a call to action for everyone in this room. I so appreciate uh, Brookings giving us the platform to dive a little bit deeper into the survey. And I welcome all of you to ask questions and engage with our folks. I do wanna say hello to our Blue Star family members around the country who are watching on Facebook Live. As uh, Secretary Curta and I were discussing, the transparency that these new tools give us to include our community in the work that we do is really spectacular. So I want you to know that we are, are joined by um, thousands if not tens of thousands um, uh, this morning. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Syracuse, for making the survey possible and also Kristen Orsha for our survey director. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Kathy. That was fascinating, and I agree that the, the survey is very rich. In fact, as we've been doing these events together the last few years, I've come to appreciate just how much myself as a defense policy analyst I need to understand these issues because they do affect the way one thinks about everything from the size of the force to op tempo to where we base people to how we base people, how often we ask them to move. So many issues that are really central to defense policy can be informed uh, in many important ways by this survey. And now we have a panel to help us dive in a bit more. Let me please briefly introduce them and then we'll go right at it. And our intention is to spend about a half hour up here uh, with initial thoughts and then go to you for your concerns and your questions. So immediately to my left, we have uh, Tony Curta, who is carrying out the duties of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. He's a retired Rear Admiral from the U.S. Navy, hails from the great state of Montana, uh, graduate of Annapolis, but also the Air Command and Staff uh, College and also Georgetown, I believe, <coughs> and uh, has been now in the Senior Executive Service for about three years uh, starting in the uh, second Obama term and now continuing into the Trump administration working on military personnel issues. To his left, we have our good friend Christina Orr Schiffer uh, with military uh, Blue Star families and uh, she is the uh, director of research and policy outreach for Blue Star families and has been uh, on this panel with us in many previous years and we look forward, we'll begin with her in just a moment. And to her left is Rosalinda Vasquez Mori who is with Syracuse's Institute on Veterans and Military Families from the great empire state that I also hail from. And, uh, but she is originally from Texas and studied at San Antonio and uh, has been doing this job at Syracuse now for a number of years, but previously had also worked on various jobs and associations with both the Coast Guard and the Air Force, so has a wide array of experiences as well. And she'll probably hone in initially on veterans questions. So we're gonna definitely get at both military families from the active and reserve forces today as well as veterans issues as well. So uh, without further ado, and Christina will begin uh, with a couple of just general thoughts from you, please, on uh, whatever else you would wanna say to reinforce or add to what Kathy's already presented, the most important survey results. And I, I like the, the, the way Kathy raised both concerns, but also the good news. And uh, what are both our you know, problems and weaknesses we've got to try to repair in the broader military community, but also some of the enduring strengths that you see in the survey. Sure. She, she did set us up uh, well, and I'll, I'll leave you or I'll introduce uh, three thoughts. Uh, first two uh, problems, third one solution in the same vein. Um, the first thought, uh, as we work through the data, um, operational tempo, deployment, uh, these things are getting harder for folks to choose to continue to serve given high operational tempo. We had that 72% indicate, which is the same statistic we had last year, of military families, service members, and their spouses who were saying that the tempo is too high. They're not getting enough dwell time. They're not getting enough advance notice. Um, also, um, the ability to know where one is moving. So PCSs, short notice PCSs, comes under that same idea. If you're only given a few months before you're able to PCS, being able to make that jump to that next location is increasingly challenging. Um, the second area that really came up is the, d the need for diverse support for a modern military. If we have a diverse need now for all sorts of different skills within the military and, and, and to ensure the defense. We also need to think that modern families are just as diverse as those needs. And so we can't forget that there are single parents that are service members, that there are professional spouses who choose to work, uh, who increasingly families need a second income. Uh, we're 23% lower uh, if you look at the average rate of married families who field two incomes. The American public is around 60%. Um, the uh, active duty per, uh, military is around 40%. So the fact that 45%. So if you look at the difference there, we're just, we're not there yet. We're always a little bit lower than where we need to be. So we need to think about diverse and new modern ways to provide support to military families. This is not your grandpa's military anymore. It's a different military. We need to think about that. Um, and the, the third, the solution, the kind of happier thought is we really did see opportunities for community engagement. DOD can't fix these problems alone. 
uh, military families can't fix these problems alone, but when we're able to wrap in the community, we find that this is a solution that's um, a great opportunity. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, those PCSs are stressful, and one of the reasons that they're stressful is that everyone needs to rebuild all those support mechanisms from finding new schools to finding new jobs to figuring out where the grocery store is to figuring out who's going to be the person on your child's emergency form. You know, when you move to a new area, uh, this happens to me every time I move. I don't know anyone. So when you say who, in case of emergency, who's going to pick up your child? <laughs> I hope that my neighbor looks trustworthy, right? Um, so, so these opportunities to really bring the community in is a, is a terrific opportunity. So again, op-tempo deployment makes it very difficult to continue to choose. Um, diverse support is something that we can do to start thinking about that. New understandings of military families and how we support them. And three, bringing that community in, um, bringing the civilians in and wrapping them around and, and using uh, coordinated uh, opportunities for support between military families and local communities as a solution to many of these issues. Thank you. I've got a couple of quick follow-ups, if I could, and some of them are, are fairly broad, so they may not be ones you can easily answer from the survey. We may wind up talking about them all morning. But you know, one thing that occurs to me when we hear about the difficulty of, of a spouse keeping a job or finding a job, do people consider this to be sort of inherent to the nature of the military enterprise? And I guess that also relates to the sense of belonging in a community, right? Do they, they don't feel always that they're really fully integrated or welcomed. Um, do, they, do, do you sense that military families believe that there are things we could do differently that would really solve these problems? Or is this inherent to the nature of being in the service and just sort of the cost of doing business? People are willing to tolerate it for a certain period of time for themselves. A lot of them don't want it for their kids, which is one more thing your survey found, that uh, so many military families don't really wish this life upon their kids, even though they're proud to have done it themselves. But in other words, is this just inherent to the military enterprise, or do people have a sense that there really are policy changes we could make that would really alleviate some of these stresses? Yes. Uh, I'll go back to my point about this not being your grandfather's military anymore. It's a different military, and the, the people serving in the military, the expectations for family support from service members, um, for the time to be home, to cook dinner, to coach soccer. These are, it's a different modern time, and what we're finding out is that spouse employment is part of that. Um, you know, if you, if you want bright people to join your military, bright people tend to marry other bright people, mm -hmm. and those people really prefer not always to, to give up a career for, for 20 years or more. So one of the challenges that we find is um, addressing the income challenge to say, um, you know, how do we solve that gap? We ended up seeing that 51% of spouses who even were employed were earning under $20,000 a year. So it's not just about employing them, it's also about giving them jobs that are uh, uh, opportunities to earn. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a big, big challenge. Um, I would also just say in terms of where we are with spouse employment is it is an expectation now. It's not always an expectation. We understand uh, the data really shows that there are periods, just with civilians as well, there are seasons when it's more likely that one would be able to work. There are some seasons when you are not as able if you're choosing to raise children or there are other challenges in the home. Um, but just like civilian communities, military spouses and uh, military couples have those same desires now. Uh, and the in the interesting part about our unemployment rate this year, which increased to 28% for military spouses, <laughs> is I don't see that as being military spouse unemployment getting worse. What we saw is a decrease in the number of spouses who were opting out of the, the of workforce mm -hmm. overall. So there's an increasing uh, expectation for employment. So it's, that it's the opposite. It's not that there's an expectation that one can't work. Rather, there's an increasing expectation now of employment. Thank you. Yeah. Can I uh, add something Yeah, it's a good moment because I want to um, shift over to you. So I think that there is definitely some impact during service, but there's actually impact after service. I mean, what people don't realize is this, these, these disadvantages have long-term consequences on a military spouse's career. Uh, so yes, there might be uh, cycles of it, but these cycles continue as a veteran spouse. And unemployment and underemployment, um, in the same survey, we had 41% reporting incomes of less than 20,000. I mean, that puts the veteran spouse at a huge 
uh, disadvantage compared to their counterparts. Um, another aspect of this that I do want to highlight or emphasize is that military spouse employment eases transition. So when, when you have a military spouse fully employed, there is a more positive uh, transition experience compared to uh, when you don't have one. So it's not just the, the spouse and the nature and the job, it's part of the service and the military as well. So. So, Rosalinda, let me move over to you now and, and ask you any other broad reactions you have to the survey. But the specific question that I really wanted to pose to you as well, you could maybe weave into your opening thoughts, is were you surprised that so many military families who are currently serving uh, don't feel all that integrated into their community? Because we know how much our country, I think it's fair to say, admires the military. Uh, this is not like a Vietnam era. Yeah. We don't have, we, we, Kathy's book told us all that we have a civil military division or separation, right. but we have very strong appreciation, I think, for the armed forces. Right. And uh, so do you attribute that problem be, to the frequency of moves? And then when people become veterans and they settle down perhaps in one place a little longer, then they do tend to feel more integrated and more appreciated for their service of prior years? Yeah. Or, or do, you, do you see a, a deeper problem going on? Well, I mean, I, 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 okay. So adjustment, readjustment to civilian life is difficult for veterans. And I think that when, if during active duty, they become more integrated, it could possibly ease the readjustments afterwards. Uh, so I see a potential solution, hopefully by the integration, that the long-term impacts can make an easier adjustment for veterans. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think when one settles down, you get integrated with the community. And I do think veterans are part of that military-civilian divide or the active duty military-civilian divide. Uh, they're part of that solution as well. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to follow up anything, Kristen. Yes, be good. Well, okay, and one more question, Rosalinda, before we go to Secretary Curta for his thoughts. I, I, just, I just think that, um, you know, it'd be good to get your take on how veterans collectively feel like they're doing. I realize the survey doesn't emphasize uh, the veterans community quite as much, but as you look out at the broad range of issues that face veterans today, everything from, you know, second careers to finances, military pension, military health care, veterans health care, PTS, related issues. Uh, what's sort of most on your mind, and did the survey help you, this year's survey in particular, help yeah. you identify any other key issues that you hadn't previously? Yeah, I think that the, the for me at least, the, the, the biggest insight is really the service members and families are not really well prepared for the transition. And it, it's not, it's a financial preparedness, it's an emotional, it's an mental, uh, being unprepared. Um, so for example, the ones, uh, approximately 15% of the sample is planning to exit within the next two years. And of that 15%, um, you know, the ones that are separating within one year um, have, 54% uh, have less than 5,000 in savings and available in case of emergencies. Um, so someone would think, oh, okay, four to 5,000, that's bad. However, um, when we look at the veteran population, 17%, it took over a year to find a job. So then that four to 5,000, is that sufficient enough for that year while you wait? Um, when we talk about transition GPS and how well it prepared you, um, and it, it was, tap, we asked a number of questions. It was TAP, it was transition GPS. We looked at it within the ones that separated this past year, two years, and so we've looked at it in many ways. But it was really consistent. It was almost 50-50. Half of them felt prepared, half of them didn't. And so, you know, there's definitely um, an unpreparedness. You're, you're getting some, but you're not getting others. Um, one thing that we asked differently this year is how, um, you know, um, how would you like those services for you available after transition? And a good quarter of them actually wanted the TAP services, that TRAP training available about two, three years after they'd already separated. So, because you know, at the time that you're separating, you may not be thinking, you may not be mentally prepared, you may, may not be all there, but you, you have to make some decisions, you have to do that now. But again, being, having that resources available afterwards would be a huge help, so. And then one just clarifying question, and then I'll go to Secretary Curta, uh, unless Kristen wants to comment as well. But just to make sure we're all, I realize people in this room are not confused about what a military veteran is and, and who that could be. But just to be clear, 
most of these people in the survey who are either recently uh, retired or, or, uh, or about to transition out, most of them probably haven't done 20 years. Some of them have. Some of them have. But many of them are going into a civilian workforce with not only right. just $5,000 in their pocket, but right. no pension right. from the military. Exactly. And, they're, and they're quite often going to be people in their late 20s or 30s right. as opposed to people nearing the end of their career. Is that sort of a fair way to yeah, characterize absolutely. the? Absolutely. I mean, very few people make the military that one career. A lot of people will exit earlier in their 20s, early 30s, uh, have another job, and obviously aren't financially prepared for that so right. transition. Great. Kristen, any further thoughts on the veterans' issues before we go to? Oh, uh, actually, I will note that one bridge, one opportunity to bridge, mm -hmm. um, to build on what Rosie was saying, was the fact that you know we did see a very strong relationship between those people who had engaged with civilians in their local communities and their willingness to recommend service overall. Yeah. Um, our recommending service numbers, we can talk about those, but we did see that one real opportunity is if you're engaged with your civilian community, if you're talking to your civilian neighbors more frequently, um, that was strongly associated with likelihood to recommend service. So I think veterans yeah. are a definite opportunity there to, to help bridge that with active duty. Absolutely. It's a great opportunity. So Secretary Curta, I'm sure you've got a lot of thoughts already, but I guess, the way I would put a question to you is, it really strikes me as a mixed bag, doesn't it? That we've got an amazing force, we've got incredibly uh, dedicated people, excellent people. The survey says that 95% of them are proud of their service and happy they've done it. Yeah. And yet, many of them don't want their kids to go through this same life. Many of them wonder what they're asking their families to go through, their spouses to go through. And so it strikes me as just a fundamentally mixed bag. I wonder if you agree with that. And then you know, the other big broad question is how much of this is inherent to the nature of military service and how much of it can we possibly change through policy? Uh, well, great, Mike. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for, for hosting. Just one disclaimer, not Secretary Curta, Tony Curta. You know, I don't want to get in trouble with <laughs> Senate or anybody else. <laughs> you know, I'm just warming the duties here. Well, I think you are uh, Deputy <laughs> Assistant Secretary. Yes, mm -hmm. so. yes. Um, uh, but I also want to thank uh, Kathy and Blue Star uh, families for what you do and for being here and for hosting this and uh, inviting the department uh, to participate. All of, all of uh, you that support uh, Blue Star families and everybody uh, here, uh, it gives me great hope knowing that as we try to sustain the all-volunteer force, um, you know, we're not alone. We have a, an entire community uh, here, uh, academia, Nonprofits, the government sector, corporations, uh, it, uh, it makes me very hopeful uh, for the future. And you know, it's, it's not like this uh, everywhere. Uh, you travel around and meet our allies and partners around the world, and uh, our all-volunteer force and the support that we get from our citizenry is unique. Uh, I think Mike talked about it, you know, there's a lot of thanking people uh, for their service. Wasn't always that way. I think our Vietnam veterans would uh, say they might have had a different experience than our, than our veterans today. But, uh, you know, we're getting uh, a lot better at it. And a lot of that is how we sustain our all-volunteer force. But I think what we're, what we're seeing is, uh, you know, the success in the future of that all-volunteer force is not guaranteed. And we talk about the military-civilian divide. We talk about 1% of our population serves, all of that is true. We talk about that it's increasingly a family affair. You only serve if somebody you know in your family has likely served. So any data that says that trend is going down is particularly uh, troubling. But Mike, to go back to your uh, question about whether a lot of what we see is inherent in the, in, in the service, I would say uh, a couple of things. One is we know our families are changing. It's not your grandpa's military. It's not, the, the family structure that we have today is not the same as it was 40 or 50 years ago. Obviously, we have to uh, adapt to that. But I would also say we, we have to adapt to the nature of the threat uh, as well. The threat's not the same today as it was 20 years ago, right? 9-11 fundamentally changed uh, what we do, how we do it. The all-volunteer force, as it was designed in the 70s, you know, was not designed to keep us now in our, what, 17th continual year of conflict with, you know, really no end in sight. The fact that it has 
prospered, been successful, and is still vibrant and strong, uh, I think is, uh, is, you know, kudos go to those that designed it and our entire um, citizenry for being able to sustain it. Um, there are some warning signs. This survey every year um, points us to those areas that we have to work at to ensure that 20 years from now we can still field an all-volunteer force. But the nature is changing. We know that our, you know, we kind of talk about um, the time with the family, the time away from the family. We hear in the news about, uh, you know, sailors in the Western Pacific um, working 100-hour work weeks. There's no time with your family at 100-hour work weeks. Um, you know, part of this is the, the challenge that we're under. We I talked about, you know, the world events. The force that we have uh, generally is getting smaller and the demands are rising. At the same time, we have budget caps, sequestration, continuing resolutions. The people caught in the middle are our forces who keep getting asked to do more and more. So obviously they're going to be under strain. I don't think any of us um, should be surprised at that. And the fact that as years go on, we take care of things like the retirement system, we take care of things relatively like compensation, and those things, those things slowly go down the list. What we, what we have the hardest time and we need everybody for is the fact that people are just being asked to do more with their time in their service, and therefore we're seeing, you know, this is the issue. I'm spending, why am I spending so much time away from home? Because that's what my country is asking me to do. We're not sending people with their families to Europe anymore. When the army goes over there, they're going to um, uh, remote or temporary fields. We're all over Africa. We're in Afghanistan and Iraq. The nature of how we use the force that we have, including our reserve and guard members, is completely different than it was 20 years ago. So um, I acknowledge all of the issues that we're going to talk about uh, today. Uh, they deserve uh, every ounce of energy we can, we can put into it. I just always want us to, to keep in mind why our families are under strain because their country is asking them to do these things and, and I'm, I'm, I'm heartened that uh, people are still signing up uh, every year, 250,000 you know, young Americans join uh, every year and we're still able to field this incredible all-volunteer force and that's wonderful, but we have to pay attention to the warning signs and that's why I think it's so valuable that we have uh, um, forums like this so that we can get ahead of the problem and, and uh, not just react to them. So as we go to a second round of thoughts and then to you, let me add my thanks as a civilian to military families and veterans. And uh, Vice President Pence did a nice job on Veterans Day of reminding us all to say thank you. And uh, I just want to do that myself and, uh, and put in the, the word of admiration for what the small group of not just men and women in uniform, but their families do for our country. Uh, but also, I want to comment on a couple of specific points in the survey and then just offer a couple of policy provocations and see if folks want to chime in, add to any of those, uh, critique any of those thoughts. I think uh, among the many kernels of wisdom in this survey, two that really stood out for me, one is certainly, and Kathy mentioned these, one is certainly that 40% of all families had someone in uniform in their family deploy for at least six months out of the last 18. And uh, it raises some questions in my mind. First question is, is why? Although I also would like to know how many of those families were sort of in the nine month and up category because six out of 18 is a lot, but it's sort of what some people think they're signing up for. Nine, 10, 12 is not what, or 15 out of 18 is not what people can realistically or reasonably be, be asked uh, to do. So I'm struck by the op tempo. Uh, but I'm also curious as to how many families are doing a lot more than six months. And that's certainly one set of findings that I find very important. But secondly, this compensation question. To me, I have to, I have to acknowledge it's changed the way I think about military compensa compensation to think about the spouse and the difficulty of the spouse finding a job and finding a good paying job. It's really changed the way I think about this because, you know, since the Reagan years, Military compensation in this country, by some definitions, has been pretty good. 
I say that with some trepidation sitting in front of an audience <laughs> like this, but, 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 if, but if you look statistically and you compare to different age cohorts and education cohorts, military compensation, uh, even before you factor in retirement for those who do 20 years, is statistically pretty good. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't factor in these second order effects, these second order considerations. So I have to admit, I've been fundamentally affected by this set of facts. And it makes me ask, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Everybody up here has said it's a problem. Uh, we're all struggling for solutions. So let me just put a couple of ideas on the table and then see how people want to respond to these or other thoughts about what we should be doing to, to address some of the real challenges here. One thought I have is to the extent that operational tempo in the military is still high, uh, I think we have to get out of the expectation some may have that we're going to build a much larger military to, to address that. I think the military should be a little bit larger, but even if the $700 billion budget goes through, uh, and I'm dubious that it will when all is said and done at the end of this year, we're not going to have a whole heck of a lot of money to grow the force very fast and in, in large numbers. So I think the services have to view this issue partly as their own challenge. And instead of, you know, maybe the grandfather's military image uh, has changed for military families. I'm not sure it's always changed for military leadership. Mm, exactly. I think there's still a machismo that deployment is good. Yeah. And even doing exercises, you know, away from base, um, you know, maybe sometimes people do a few more of those than they really need to do. Maybe more exercises and training can be done at home base. I, I just want to ask that question. I wonder if, you know, to pick on a couple of services, I wonder if our friends in the Army can think about asking uh, civilian leadership if maybe we could have the brigade in Poland be permanently stationed there with families, and the same thing in Korea. I don't know, you know, Korea is a developed country these days. Yes, it's a dangerous place, but we have 200,000 civilian Americans living in Korea. I don't think military families are so shy of being in a, you know, dicey uh, geostrategic theater that we can't consider that. Because right now the Army likes to say, well, we, we are rotating forces through, and that's a way to spread the burden and so forth. But the Army also complains that it only has three brigades ready out of 58, uh, which is another debate. And, and, and also we know that Army families are, the, some of the families responding to this survey, saying that they feel overdeployed. So if separation is the problem, maybe we can reunite families with service members in more of the locations abroad where they typically serve. I'm not suggesting we can do that in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, but I do think there are places we can consider it. Can the Navy think a little bit uh, differently about the way it maintains forward deployments? Again, maybe we have too much of a machismo that says we've got to have a certain number of ships deployed. Um, maybe more irregular deployments of different lengths can sometimes be just as effective in certain theaters. There may be places where you literally need a ship within 30 miles of a potential enemy all the time. I don't deny that. But there may be other places where a more you know, unpredictable set of deployments and at a somewhat lower pace could actually achieve many of the same strategic effects. And I wonder if the Navy can also think more about dual crewing for given ships. We do this with minesweepers, with submarines. The Navy has never wanted to have surface combatants share crews, where a crew would deploy, on, would train on one ship in home waters, and then fly to relieve a crew on a deployed ship overseas. You save the two months of ocean transit going and coming with that approach. I know there are a lot of logistical complications, and my Navy friends have explained them to me at length. I'm just not convinced uh, that it really has to just be one crew for one ship all the time. I could go on, but you've probably heard enough of these kind of thoughts. I'm really just trying to provoke a conversation. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll really just turn to the panelists for their thoughts on these or any other policy options we might have before us, I think the services have tried to give people a little more predictability in where they're based in the United States with some of the mega bases, for better or worse. And we know our Marines are often in North Carolina and California, and a lot of our soldiers are in Texas and a couple other states where there are concentrations of bases, and, you know, and other services have done the same. I wonder if that process could and should go further so that people have an even greater likelihood of staying in one place for two or three tours if they so choose and if they want that. Or maybe it's just not realistic. And if it's not realistic uh, to have people stay longer, then how are we really going to affect the spousal deployment or mm -hmm. employment challenge? I don't really know what else we can do. And maybe we have to just accept that um, 
we're going to have a high spouse unemployment rate, and therefore this is an additional argument in favor of military compensation increasing a little bit, even though on paper it looks pretty good already. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the ideas I just want to put before the jury, so to speak, mm -hmm. and, um, but you can ignore them and, and offer any other suggestions. Mm -hmm. I just want to have one round of thoughts on, uh, on you know, solutions or ways we can remediate some of these problems we're seeing in the military community today. And, and why don't we start with you, Rosalind, and just work down. I'll, uh, I'll comment on the military spouse issue. Um, you know, just like the Army's changing, just like, you know, the, the military's changing, I think employment landscape is changing. Uh, you know, it's, it's not the same employment situation or the, 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 la the landscape. It doesn't look the same 20 years ago. Technology is a huge component of it. Uh, because of that, we're able to work remote. We're able to uh, be flexible, adaptable, and do much more with it. Uh, so for you know, employers wanting to work with military spouses, offering career portability is one opportunity instead of you know, increasing the pay of military but having these opportunities available for military spouses. Um, I, I would definitely... Um, have employers, you know, and I, I work in both the military families and the veteran space, and I see it, and, and all with you know, good intentions, I, I do see a lot of initiatives, and, and we tend to lump veterans and military families together, but they're not the same population. They have unique challenges, different challenges. So I, I would encourage employers to specifically look at the unique aspects of military spouses and what potential opportunities does your employment can offer that. So that's, that's great. all I have to say. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kristen. Um, and I, I would add to that that uh, our survey data does bear out that it's not employment readiness mm -hmm. uh, or even the ability to find a job. Oftentimes, the greater challenges have to do with uh, aligning with schedules mm -hmm. or the moves. You're right on the moves. And moves are a challenge which could potentially be addressed with some of the right. um, portability or the, the virtual work. But the other one is um, just schedules. It, it, more, flex, or more predictability in scheduling. Um, many military families uh, in, in their uh, qualitative re responses. So we ask open-ended questions sometimes. And, and one of the trends that we see is um, it, it's the fact that I don't know what time my spouse is going to be home tonight. I don't even know, uh, you know if, if he's flying a plane at 5 p.m. the next day, maybe I'll find out if he's going to fly in the morning or the afternoon. And those are the kinds of things I can't commit to a schedule even that addresses that heightened work load that the service member is having because there is so little predictability even when the service member is at home. And a lot of that may have to do with budget caps right now and an inability to fund um, at levels that are needed by the services. But I would say that increasing the, the predictability uh, at home, not when they're deployed, but just when they're at home, does go a long way um, to increasing the ability of, of spouses to work. Um, and I would also say in terms of um, the op tempo. So burnout is the top reason that people leave jobs in the civilian world. Um, over half of the turnover every year, uh, the half of the people who leave, they leave because of burnout. Um, so that we know that military families or service members aren't different than their civilian counterparts and that burnout is one of these issues. Um, it's, it's burnout, uh, it's too much time, it's also family reasons. We asked people who were intending to exit, what was the top reason that you're intending to exit in the next two years? And the top two reasons both had to do with family. One was the concern, the impact of service on children and on their families. And number two was just time away. It was just too much time away to feel that they, they were missing out on too, much, uh, too many opportunities with their, their the life was not complete. So I will say that those are really the two areas that I think are, are really opportunities, is, is looking at more predictability um, at home, which is directly linked to some of the funding uh, challenges that we're having right now. Um, hopefully those may imp improve. And then also this idea of um, addressing family time um, while they are home, giving them that more predictability and then giving them the ability to do things like coach soccer for their children or be there um, to relieve uh, the time so their spouses are able to go to work. Those are two, two opportunities that are close to some of the policy suggestions that you've asked for. So, oh, please, yeah, Why don't you come on up and grab the microphone so we can hear you. Just to take the 
prerogative. I, I think there's so many um, solutions, and a lot of them don't, even, don't require government work mm -hmm. because we have an uh, economy that really needs talented workers, and we have a lot of underemployed or unemployed talented workers. Blue Star Families has 34 employees who are mostly military spouses. We've been growing at a rate of 20% a year, year over year. Even while our folks deploy, um, move on short notice, Kristen moved on two months notice to Italy. She didn't lose her job. Um, all, all of us do, and we can keep the uh, enterprise going. We need help from DOD in articulating to the larger country um, that this is a patriotic duty and an economic opportunity for people to bring on talented um, personnel, but we need them to have jobs that can be done remotely or have career portability. They need to have flexibility of hours. They need career progression if someone wants progression or the opportunity for quality gig work if people want that. We have a military spouse employment program which does great work, but they can't do it alone. Organizations like ours, um, Hire Under Heroes, others, but corporations, and a message that this is what our military needs to be able to feel the, the missions it has. It can't be that this is the package, because if it's the package, that 40% recommending service is going to become 30% than 20%. The solution is everybody wins. The military gets the second employment, the, uh, the, employ the second income, the uh, employers get the good quality. We need innovative ways to make that easier to identify people. And, and, and I'm very positive about the solutions. I just wanted to jump in and, and, and add that. That's great. And Mr. Curta, I know you've, you, you've not only got an important job at the Pentagon today, you've been an admiral in the Navy, so you've seen this from multiple vantage points. There's a lot on the table. I just wondered how you'd want to comment. Well, there, you know, there's so much uh, in this survey and so much for, uh, you know, to keep, us, uh, to keep us all busy, but the one the one uh, item in it that, uh, uh, you know, to me is the darkest cloud on the horizon, potentially, uh, because one of the things that seizes me the most is, you know, it, what's the state of the all-volunteer force in, in 20 years? Are we still able to recruit and retain uh, and train and maintain the force that we, we have today? And as I said, um, it's not guaranteed. Without a lot of hard work and the entire country behind us, uh, we won't we won't succeed. And since we have relatively small all-volunteer force, since it is 1% of our population or less, since it is a family business, um, all of the strain that we talk about here is leading those currently in service at declining amounts to recommend to their children, not only to their children, but to everybody they know um, for those uh, you know, coming behind them to, to put on the uniform and, uh, and serve their country. And of course, it's not just those in service today that recommend country, it's the influencers out in society. So this, is, this goes back to where we need uh, everybody's help. It's our teachers, it's our coaches, it's our high school counselors, it's our pastors. Um, all of those people are recommending military service at, uh, at declining rates. Now, you know, part of that is 16 years of war and in society, uh, everybody appreciates the military, yes, but there's an, kind of an increasing view of what our veteran looks like. Those, pers those people that transition from society are either ill, have a problem transitioning back into civilian society, they're injured or personally disabled, right, in, in some manner. There is, I mean, that's just, we have the data, that is an increasing perception among society. And, uh, you know, part of that is all DOD's fault because we don't, uh, we don't combat that perception enough. So, but we need everybody's help in talking about the power of our military spouses, the power of our veterans, how much they contribute to society, how much they can and do contribute to society, and influencers, which is everybody in this room, in, in highlighting the positive aspects of military service. When we see when people get out of the service, what do they miss the most? What is the pr protective factor that they lose that actually raises their, their uh, risks for suicide when they leave the service? It's that camaraderie. Mm -hmm. It's that sense of mission. It's that being a part of something that's bigger than yourself, a mission that's big and bigger than yourself. And yet we don't do a very good job of highlighting that to our young men and women in the age 17 and 24 to come into the service. Yes, we talk about 
the pay package. Mm -hmm. Yes, we talk about uh, you know all of the benefits, the GI Bill, all of those sort of things. All those things are great. You know what job you can train and how it may give you a skill for life. All those are are uh, are very important. And everything appeals you know differently to people. You've got to do everything to to get two hundred fifty thousand uh, young qualified interested people uh, every year. But we need to to highlight that sense of mission. And, and what people get out of contributing to the country, the value of public service. There's many ways to serve our country. Uniform is one of them. That happens to be the business that we're in. But there's, there's many ways to do it. And so we need you know, everybody's help here in, in talking up the value of public service to our young people. There's a responsibility that comes with citizenship. Again, many things you can do. Uniform is one of them. We'd like to see a, a certain number of them uh, choose that path. But it's it's, uh, it's the role of influencers in society talking to young people to say, hey, take a look at it. When you see the message, when somebody talks to you about service, be open to it because these, these are the great things about serving your country in uniform. And that's where we need everybody's help. And that's why I uh, so much appreciate Blue Star and their survey asking this question because that's a trend that absolutely cannot continue if we need and want a volunteer force in 20 years. Fantastic. By the way, let me say as we go to your uh, questions and your thoughts that this will uh, live on not only on the Facebook page of, um, of Blue Star Families, but also their website, bluestarfam.org, uh, the brookings.edu website. And so we look forward to now including uh, many of your thoughts and questions as well. So let's, why don't we take two or three at a time. I will start with, I can't resist a, a woman with a baby. In the, <laughs> and, 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 we'll, and then we'll um, uh, also take a question up here, two questions up here before we go to the panel. Yeah, she will. The microphone's not on yet. Uh, we probably need the microphone because we want to make sure that you're recorded for posterity. <laughs> Are we switching out mics or what are we doing? Okay. okay. That's okay. No, thank you. So again, we'll take three questions together, and then we'll have a series of responses. Over to you. Hi, my name is Amanda Leffler. Oh, sorry, it's really echoey. Um, and I'm from After the Long Walk, which is a peer-to-peer -peer support network for explosive ordnance disposal technicians and their families. So um, our goal is to reduce suicides by offering peer-to-peer -peer support through a hotline and also Facebook page. It's working really well, although we don't have numbers because we don't have a survey. But as we've been talking today, one of the things that I've been wondering is why don't we break this down by MOS? So that way you can see what the challenges are by MOS, because what you're talking about, our community experiences to the extreme. 100% of our techs have traumatic brain injuries and also injuries to the rest of their, their bodies from the per percussive um, force injuries. So you think if you're experiencing repeated explosions, that's doing a lot to your entire body, not just your brain. So, you know, bringing that stress home, our family members are experiencing high stress all the time because there's stress when they're away, like my husband is gone right now for an entire year over in Afghanistan. You mentioned that. Um, but um, there's also the stress when they come home because they don't leave that on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. It comes home with them, and it's at home with them all the time. So maybe also talking about, you know, branch-specific or MOS-specific, since we're all four branches, you know, how do we go ahead and help folks where they're at, like, in that niche? You know, because our needs in our community are very different from, like, a flyer's needs or surface warfare or anybody else, really. So Thank you very much for the question. Yeah. yeah. Come up here now to the fourth row and then to the fifth. Hello. Um, my name is Patty Barron. I'm with the Association of the United States Army. And I wanted to just kind of piggyback on what you said, Mr. Hanlon, and that was about um, the services, maybe looking at some of the specific things that they can do. Three things came to mind while you were talking, and there are things that um, I've been seeing an awful lot of. A lot of military spouses are entrepreneurs. 
They're starting their own businesses, and that's one way that they're seeing that they can manage the, the, the employment or unemployment piece in their lives. And they're doing pretty good. As a matter of fact, at AUSA, when I contract out, when I have consultants, I hire only military spouses to help me with some of the things I need. But what we heard was when they go from installation to installation, sir, the installation policies for being able to do, um, to have your own business on an installation are very archaic and they need to be updated. And so that's something that the services can look at, update those, um, uh, those policies so that it's easier for a spouse to have their own business on an installation. The second thing that I wanted to mention, and it's in the survey, and that's childcare. We need to make childcare more available for those that have part-time employment or need uh, it only for specific reasons. And I have a spouse that I talked to the other day who has her own business. She's moving from Colorado Springs to Fort Irwin, California, and uh, she can't even sign up for childcare because she has to attend a course that the child care center is offering before she can then apply for her child to to be in that center. Now that is ridiculous because Mm -hmm. she has all the paperwork, she could send it, she could fax it, she could do whatever, but until she's physically there to attend that course, she can't um, sign her child up for child care. So I think we need to look at that. And then then the third thing that I want to talk about, um, and um, it just left me, so when it comes back, (laughs) I'll let you know. Let's do one more and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, it was, there was, was it the woman in the red shirt behind, or was it you? I, there, was, there were two in a row here who... Okay, we'll go to yeah. Sandy. Thank you. Sandy Apgar, CSIS. Uh, first, would opening bases in the manner that we had before pre-9-11 uh, help to foster community engagement? Mm. Uh, during my term in office, we used to measure installation commanders on their effectiveness in the local community engagement and of all of their services. And secondly, uh, if you were to have uh, commissioned this survey in the 1990s, housing would have been first on the list or among the top two. Um, But I note that it's not on the list anymore. Does that suggest that the poor condition of military housing uh, and related services has been largely addressed by the DOD public-private partnerships and other initiatives. Um, what else could be done using the same vehicle since it has been proven to be effective? Thank you. Okay, why don't we start? Would you like to begin, Mr. Secretary, or do you want to start at the other end and we'll work towards you? No. Um, yep. Yep. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk about it. First, I, I want to say uh, thank you very much for uh, any peer-to-peer support uh, network. Um, that's certainly an emerging area of, uh, uh, of, uh, of help and uh, comfort to all of our, uh, our service members. Uh, we offer a lot of, through Military One Source, uh, a lot of non-medical counseling, military and family life counseling to all of our service members 24-7 uh, in, in many different ways. Uh, but a, one, an emerging subset of that um, is uh, in partnership with the, with the VA is, um, is peer-to-peer support. And when we talk about family resiliency, you're right, it's not all the same because people not only by MOS but by service, by geography, um, are facing a different uh, situations. So particularly in the peer-to-peer support world, it tends to be a little bit more, uh, more focused, whether it's on service or... Uh, uh, or MOS. So uh, I applaud you for helping with that. I acknowledge uh, all of the uh, all of the particular challenges, particularly those in the special operations world, uh, have uh, uh, are experiencing over the last 16 years. In particular, and probably have the highest op tempo. Uh, clearly, have the highest op tempo across uh, across the board. Um, and so, while I know the special operations community is doing a lot of their own uh, medical uh, research in, 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 and as well in the peer-to-peer support, there's clearly uh, a lot to be, uh, to be done in that world. Um, when we talk about uh, child care, um, it continues to be, we you know, talk about the nature of the families, dual, dual uh, employment, uh, obviously uh, child care continues to be at the, at the top of the list. I think we made some, some very good uh, progress. Uh, we have 
you know, we're basically the largest, you know, private health care or the private um, child care uh, deliverer in, in the country. And we offer uh, accreditation, uh, accredited services, and uh, at a much, much higher rate than you will find out in the uh, civilian world. One of the things that we've tried to do is, uh, specifically to the point that you talk about, is allow people earlier access to understand what the child care um, resources are in the area that they're going to and being able to sign up and get on the list before you arrive there and you're already a day behind in need, mm -hmm. right? So uh, militarychildcare.com is supposed to get at exactly what you stated so people can get on uh, a waiting list and know what's in the area uh, available to them long before they get there and sign up and find out what resource is best for them. Does, doesn't mean we've, uh, we've got the problem solved or anything like that, but it, it has attention. We're making uh, some progress, clearly uh, much more to do uh, in that world. And then, you know, just the, the last uh, question on open bases, uh, we, would, we would love to have, uh, you know, the situation on our bases that we, we had in the late, well, probably in the early to mid 90s, mm -hmm. um, right? Uh, unfortunately, events like the Washington Navy Yard, Port Hood, any, I mean, you take any number uh, of those and you have to be kind of a, a little bit um, cognizant of the, of the time that we live in uh, and the threat that we face. So I don't, as much as it would address a lot of the problems that we have, uh, it would also open uh, up avenues to, to others that I'm not sure, you know, when you, when you balance that risk, I'm not sure anytime soon it's, uh, we're, we're going to see easier access uh, to our bases. Doesn't mean we can't have smarter access and work on identity management a lot better. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that we can do and do better in there so, so that we know who we're letting onto our bases. Um, but I, I doubt if that environment is going to change anytime soon. Kristen. Sure. Um, so in, in terms of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, we found this year substantially higher rates of depression and anxiety uh, among all subgroups except for active duty. Uh, so we had uh, the rate for depression. And so to be clear, what we were asking was, have you been diagnosed, uh, medically diagnosed with depression or anxiety? And we had 24% of active duty military spouses indicate that they had been diagnosed with depression and 30% with anxiety. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough job out there. Um, veterans and, and their and veteran spouses the, the rates were worse. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer counseling is one opportunity. I, I think that, that really is something that we need to keep moving on uh, because we are just starting to talk about the, uh, some of the emotional strains that over time have really uh, come to the forefront. As we've been able to talk about suicide um, in veterans, I think we're starting to open up other mental health opportunities uh, also for active duty as the news has been uh, covering lately, and also for uh, military spouses as well, because it's a largely unexplored issue, but it's, a, it's kind of an open secret within the, the military spouse community. Um, in terms of uh, what Patty was talking about, um, <laughs> updating business practices to me is a, is a really important opportunity, and it, it's an illustration of the, the need for an updated model for DOD to think uh, a little bit more about what the modern service member and their family looks like. So I think you, you really hit the nail on the head. This is, a, this is one that's an easy change, but there is that traditional um, model. So, so I think they're, they're getting there, but that's certainly one that, that we're working on uh, changing. And then three with the housing, 60% um, of, of service members now live off base. Um, so I think one, uh, housing has gotten better. Uh, it's not at the same level in our survey, but one of the things that we are watching that is a perennial concern is the issue with BAH, uh, the reductions over time every year. It's dropping by 1%, 2% uh, with the goal of, I think, 95% of BAH being covered instead of 100% uh, in a few years. And so that's an issue that's very concerning for our community. Um, and, and in terms of uh, open bases, yes, I, I think our organization experienced some challenges with that initially, too, trying to, to provide uh, services support on bases. Uh, but also, it ties back into the community opportunity. I think we have many opportunities to also have off-base events that are still uh, recognized and, and communicated on base. And that may be an easier way to kind of square the circle with that one, at least until we get into an environment that's a little bit more secure. Thank you. Rosalinda. 
Uh, well, I'll only add a few things, and then, um, but I, I like the MOS. Uh, I definitely think we should be including that. Yeah, there you go. Oh, it's already uh, the, the wheels are spinning. The wheels are spinning year. for sure, because uh, it is exactly. I mean, the, there is diversity in the military. Not all branches are equal, and just like that, there's diversity in the occupations that they're in. Uh, and so, you know, and there's not a lot of data, uh, veteran suicide, active duty suicide, military spouse suicide and depression and all of it. So absolutely adding the MOS allows us to zone in. Could you define the acronym and you use BAH, so we'll make sure we're an acronym military free zone. Occupation, ah. oh, okay. I realize military everybody in this room knows, but. Say, yes. <laughs> and then BAH. Basic allowance for housing. There so the, the stipend that Thank offsets uh, the cost for in the certain areas where you're living for housing. Thank yeah. you. Back to you. Uh, so yeah, definitely something to include for next year. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned military spouse entrepreneurship as a, a pathway for military spouses. Uh, when you're dissatisfied with the civilian sector and the opportunities, go create your own business and go for it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say just hire a military spouse. It's good for business. It's good. No, there's actually a business case to hire military spouses. Uh, the same reasons, you know, that the PCS they moved around. Well, that made them adaptable. Uh, there's a lot of skills, skills that are valuable for for employers. So, again, just those same skills can be applied towards entrepreneurship, um, and definitely for those that are uh, dissatisfied to look into entrepreneurship because you can create your own opportunities. There you go. Great, let's go to another round. It might have to be the last one, okay. so I'll probably, this time I think I'll take it more in the spirit of a lot of views, and we'll just, we're not gonna oblige the panel to respond to each and every concern, okay. but especially in this forum, I like to make sure people get a chance to express their concerns. So I'm gonna take about six questions, and then we're just gonna have one quick round of wrapping up. We'll begin here in the fourth row, please. Um, your number of seven If, if you could wait for your microphone, and then also identify yourself, please, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Christy Hamm. I'm from Military Families for High Standards, and I'm on the board of United Through Reading. You listed 7,891 surveys were received. Can you break those down by your three categories? How many were military spouses, how many were active duty, and how many were veteran? Great. Let's, let's oh, wait. Let's right. just do a big group. Okay, there was a hand over here. Yes, please. And then we'll go back three rows. Good morning, Colonel Aries Menser. I'm a uh, military fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Just a question on, uh, if you look across the services, assignment notification vary, uh, assignment notification policy varies between six months and 18 months ahead of being relocated by service. And then if you look at um, policies for how assignments are applied, you'll see that some services have greater transparency, greater member input, and greater consideration of the military spouse who is not an active duty member. What are we doing from an internal department perspective to, um, as we look at uh, evolving our talent management practices for today's all volunteer force to um, allow for more member input, more assignment notification, and more transparency in our policies? Great, and then we'll go three rows back, if we could, please. Um, yes, good, after good, good morning. Just a dovetail on what uh, fully ahead of me said. Um, an update on, um, the Force of the Future initiatives, um, as she was mentioning, the flexibility with assignments and um, and things of that nature that would um, get at a lot of the great ideas that everybody on the stage has mentioned. Uh, we've been talking about these things for years, and um, the issue has been actually implementing them. So one, it would be wonderful to hear an update on the Force of the Future, which I believe Secretary Carter was on to something really good with things like transparent assignments, giving people a say that, uh, that they have a say in their assignments. And when they do feel heard, they're more loyal to their organization and likely to stay, even if they don't necessarily get their way. Um, so one issue is force of the future. And the second is what are we doing or looking at um, as far as who's in the manpower systems who will implement these policies? Right now we have a blend in all the services of active duty as well as civilians. But as we know, many of the people that are civilians are former active duty. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because of their experience and understanding the system. But sometimes that creates a view or paradigm to where we can't possibly implement something new. That would break the system or that would cost money. 
Um, and so we're talking about it's not our grandparents' military, and yet we still have some people who are even pre-all-volunteer force uh, working in the manpower system and can't get their heads around some of these wonderful ideas, and it creates an institutional inertia by people who are institutionalized mm -hmm. who therefore will ultimately hurt the institution in the long run. Thank you. So we're going to do one here and then... Well, maybe one in the back, and then we'll come to the panel for the final set of remarks. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Everett, and I'm currently an engineering PhD student, and so excuse me if my question gets a bit technical. And this is primarily to Admiral Curta and you, Dr. O'Hanlon, is this. BRAC survey, uh, like BRAC analyses for ba various rounds of base closures have never accounted for metropolitan area size of community and thus the employ employability for a spouse or other. And so over the rounds of BRAC, you've had bases close in major metropolitan areas or where there's a lot of potential employability, whereas bases, and because that isn't factored in, like you have Bragg and Polk and all these places out in the middle of nowhere where service spouses can't get get jobs, where where other than like Lewis and San Diego, virtually no, none is in a major metropolitan area. So that, but then how do you also deal with issues surrounding licensure? Like one of my best friends, who's a talented signal officer, got. Um, who was then accepted into Army Special Operations Command, chose to get out because his wife, who was an optometrist, couldn't transition her, transition her license to North Carolina. And so she chose to, so they chose to get out, and he took a civilian job with the FBI instead. Thank you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Do, um, there's one here in the back. Yes. Uh, yeah, good morning. My name is uh, Chris Pace. I'm the health director for the U.S. Army Soldier for Life program. So w I would like to dovetail on the other statistics question up here. Um, curious, out of the 8,000 respondents, nearly 8,000, what's the breakdown with enlisted versus officer and the average age of their respondent is what I'm really curious of. And then secondly, of the veterans, uh, what definition was used for veteran? Is it the standard VA definition for veteran or was there another uh, case definition in your study? So, Chris, you want to start with um, that and any other questions you want to address, and then we'll just... Sure. I'll, I'll actually, Rosie, and because it's a veteran question, I'll, I'll go ahead with Rosie with that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we use the same question that the VA yeah. asked, as well as the American Community Survey. So did you serve on active duty for the, you know, at least 30 days in the past and so forth? So. And the discharge status. And the discharge status, exactly. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, anywhere that we could use standard questions that are used in, in either the, in the census or ACS, right. uh, we use the same ones so we can compare them. Um, uh, I will say, um, in terms of uh, our breakdown, um, the majority of the, the respondents were military spouses. We had about 65% military spouses, 15% active duty, 20% veteran, give or take. That's off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, so forgive me if it's not quite accurate. But we also do analysis to identify different areas. So, so we cut the data so we can look. We don't take it as a whole and then interpret it like that. So we will look at just the active duty perspective for some. We will look at active duty uh, with the active duty spouse for some. And then sometimes we'll look at all of them overall. So we look at uh, different cuts of the data based on what we think is, is um, the most enlightening, uh, you know, where that question's uh, most relevant and what data set and what respondent set is most relevant to those questions. Rosalinda, any other questions? Then we'll let Secretary. No, I just want to add that it's probably the only survey that does take all these Always. populations into one survey, and we're not focused on one service branch. It's not just the Army. It's across all armies. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head on the enlisted versus officers, but I do think that there was a represent, represent, do you know? A representative sample. Yeah, yeah. We were, we were, oh. But we do have a major, I mean, there's both representation on both enlisted like and 60 officer. 60 percent enlisted. Yeah. So, so it was a little higher on officer. But in terms of branches, we were within 1 percent uh, of the breakdown for every branch um, of the population. So it, we were pretty happy. This was our best, best representative sample that we've had. I'll just say one quick thing and then leave whatever's left for you, Mr. <laughs> Secretary. But, but the question that was posed to me and to you as well about the BRAC process, which um, isn't going to solve most of our problems because we're not going to presumably reopen bases we've already shut to solve these problems. But going forward, I think your question is actually very good because I think it's basically correct that even though BRAC legislation allows for other factors to be considered, 
DOD has used the BRAC process primarily to maximize its own internal efficiency, mm -hmm. which is what it's what, that's what it was asked to do, in fairness. But there are a lot of other considerations not just whether you're near a big city or not, but even within a city. I mean, I'm still confused as to why Walter Reed Washington got closed in a part of D.C. that needed the jobs after they just spent a billion dollars refurbishing the installation. And Bethesda, where we don't need any more traffic or business, got all the joy and all the added. We love Walter Reed, we love, but, but, but we also love Bethesda Navy, and I'm not sure we really needed to mix them or, or, or combine them. But the 2005 BRAC decided to promote jointness and that was part of why I think we saw that. So I, if we're going to do another BRAC, I think issues like um, economic opportunities for individual military families, but also for that community writ large, should be part of the equation. And we need a broader definition of what BRAC's trying to achieve than simply internal DOD accounting efficiency. So I, I, I second your, your general point. And with that, sir, over to you to wrap up for us today. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to take a little bit of a poetic license here and, uh, and not try to answer every question that there was, but there are a few things, at least two, that I want to just uh, talk about. One is, uh, is the, the panoply of ideas that was under the, uh, the Force of the Future uh, uh, moniker. And um, I just uh, assure uh, everybody that, particularly those that dealt with the future of the all-volunteer force, which was uh, many of them directly, uh, we still continue to churn away at uh, all of those ideas. Some of the things that you uh, see today were directly as a result of that. You know, the increased uh, um, dollars and hours that went to our, uh, our, uh, our child care centers, the, uh, the expansion of uh, family and adoption leave. Um, all of those things uh, were part of that effort. And, and one of the good things about the uh, about that effort was it was a lot of ideas that had bubbled up that had been uh, in the minds of the personnel experts, if you will, for many years. We just needed some help getting things uh, over the line, raising the awareness uh, and the importance of those. Um, the, the last piece of those that continues, uh, mostly on the service level, is their individual advancement of their talent management systems. And it, it won't be a one-size-fits-all, I don't think, on that, because the service cultures are so unique, they have different personnel systems, and, and you know, those service cultures are a war fighting advantage. So there are some times that you want to have a DOD solution to something, particularly if it's in a business line or something like that. But when it comes to war fighting cultures, and talent management is a war fighting culture, you want to take advantage of those, those services identities, those service cultures, you want to, you want to uh, enhance and maintain that such that rate they retain their, uh, their fighting effectiveness. So those talent management systems tend to be going on inside each one of the services, and we could talk forever about each, how each service is doing that, uh, that differently. And then last, the gentlemen, when you talk about licensure, credentialing, and, and portability, we talk about it, yes, in the context of our military spouses, but all, also in the context of our active duty service members uh, and, our, and our veterans. And you know, sometimes you talk about the hard work of, of government mm. and uh, dealing with states uh, who control licensures and credentialing and portability. There has just been a ton of, of uh, awfully hard slogging that has been done over the past uh, number of years. We've engaged with a lot of the governors and you find out that in many states, the governors don't have the executive power to do it. You gotta work with the state legislatures. So we have, we have, we are literally working with every state legislature to advance the cause of, of uh, credentialing, portability, uh, and, um, and licensure. Um, you know, part of that is it's, uh, uh, every state wants you to change and get a new credential, a new license when you come into their state because it's money. It's money, right? So when you say, well, I'm, I'm in Maryland and I will accept uh, Idaho's licensure. Well, if you don't get money for that, the state has to figure out how to, how to do that. So, but I, I just want to assure everybody, s some things aren't very uh, visible. Uh, they're not necessarily very uh, sexy, but there are a lot of uh, dedicated uh, people in and out of government that are working uh, issues like that. It will pay off, but it will pay off over time. But it's a very, very important issue. Kathy, unless there's anything you want to add at this point, I'll, I'll close now by, by thanking you and Blue Star families and everyone here 
uh, military and veterans' families for what you do for the country, for being here today. And please join me in thanking the panel.